Unlocked is brought to you by Invincible, a program designed to unlock the potential of people and teams inside your organization. Join companies like Pfizer, Delta, the CDC, Google, and Chick-fil-A and others in over 116 countries that are currently using this program to increase productivity and develop healthy cultures. Access hundreds of hours of content that is accessible anytime, anywhere. And finally, use real-time data to understand the health of every team inside your organization, which teams are performing and which ones aren't. Then understand the why behind that performance. Get free access to Invincible for 30 days by visiting www.giant.tv slash 30 days. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Unlocked, where we talk about unlocking the potential of people in order to unlock the potential of our organizations. Chris Dyer is one of the probably most knowledgeable people that I've heard talk about remote work lately. Uh, we've been in this pandemic for over a year now. We've been talking about remote work for a long time. I've been talking about remote work for a long time. Chris brings some new, fresh insights. And the reason why is because Chris, he is the founder of a company called People G2, which is a background check company. He's also ranked as a leadership speaker, number one leadership speaker by Inc. Uh, he has taken his, he took his company remote in 2009. And it wasn't because of a pandemic and it wasn't because of anything like hip and cool. It was out of necessity, but he learned a lot of lessons from that and is sharing those lessons with us. One interesting thing that he shared with us, and you need to stay tuned to learn about this, is what's called a cockroach meeting. What? Yeah, cockroach meeting. That's a little teaser for you. So um, Chris is going to bring some really good insights into meetings and what they do for us and what they do against us and how we can be more intentional about having effective meetings while working remote and keeping our people healthy. All right, you ready? Here we go. All right, Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, it's gonna be good. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated. First off, um, you are the founder of People G2, which is a background um, company, uh, background research for job placement and, and, and companies looking to hire. Um, interesting, you've been in that for a while, but your new book, is about remote work. Right. So to me, I go, hold on a second. What happened there? Where's, where's that transition? Which one came first? You know, um, to, can you tell me about that journey? Sure. So back in 2001, I started the company, uh, really because of nine 11, I was working in a job I hated for a person I hated, you know, I'm too afraid to go out and do something on my own, you know, or at least secure enough, right? I had a salary, I had a mortgage and it was like, do I just keep doing this thing that's safe? And 9-11 happened and I was like, oh, it's like someone released me from a spell, right? That I could, oh, I, life's too short. I need to go take chances. I cannot work for this person another day. And I literally quit the next day and went and started People G2. And so we began by November uh, 1 of 2001, we were rocking and rolling and working for our first client. And so from that point up until about 2009, everything was always very focused on, you know, we were small, really small. It was just me on day one, right? But it was a really small company for a long time. And I was always very focused on my clients, on my technology. And, um, you know, then the recession happened in 2009. So we had the big housing you know, crisis, we had the recession, like 40% of my clients were mortgage companies and they all like disappeared, went out of business and didn't pay their bills. And so I had to very quickly figure out how to save the company. And one of the ways we figured out to do that was for us to go remote. And so I took the company completely remote in 2009. And there was a lot that went into that to prepare everybody for it. But we didn't even know what we were doing. No one, we didn't. I knew one other person, my co-author from the book, who was remote. So I leaned on her to see what she did. And, but it was purely a, a strategy, a fiscal strategy, right? This was not a, 
you know, we didn't do remote work because we thought it was better. We just did remote work because we could afford it that way. And we could keep all of our people. But very quickly, we realized once we did this, how much better work was, how much happier everybody was, how much we, more work we got done because we had deep time to think, right? To be alone, to not have interactions and interruptions that were not, you know, productive to the day. And it was that moment that I went, light bulb went on and I said, holy smokes, I didn't say smokes, but you know, I said, you know, something a little more dramatic, but I, I, I have been focusing on the wrong things. I should be focused on my people. I should be working on them and how we work and the company and the culture first, and really as the primary driver, right? So I now spend 80 to 90% of my time on that inside the company. And by doing that, by, you know, literally wielding my machete of cultural goodness all day and clearing away crap for people and removing obstacles and creating better paths for them to get their jobs done, they're incredibly better at doing almost everything compared to me, right? They're better at customer service. They're better at IT. They're better at sales. I hire all these great people and they can go out and do their best work because I'm working on them and their goals and their teams and the, all the culture and the glue and the norms and all that stuff. And so really it was, we started doing that stuff and then we started rapidly growing. And then we started winning all these awards. And I mean, like no one ever paid attention to us from 2001 to 2009, like literally not an article, not an award, not a mention. And now we're getting written up in the newspaper and now we're getting all this stuff because we're doing this and it's different and it's working. And so that really was the journey for me that people started asking me to, to speak, to come and talk about it. Um, then I started a podcast, a radio show. Someone asked me to write a book about culture. I'm like, do you, do you know I don't know how to write? Like literally all my emails have misspellings, but okay, I'll write a book. And then that book, and then the same publisher came back and asked me to write a book on remote work before the pandemic. So we were actually working on this before COVID even was a thing, or at least a thing that anyone around me was paying attention to. So it's sort of a really interesting, I, I say, I've said a lot of stuff in my life, just a bunch of like accidents or like, I don't know, you're walking down the road and you, you fall down and then you go, oh, there's a penny on the ground. Okay. And, you know what I mean? Like you find something good out of all these little stumbles as you, as, as you go along. And we've been able to sort of then take those things and try to, try to magnify them, try to turn it into something great and run with it. So, you know what I call that? I call that vision. <laughs> it's what I call that. Um, your ability to see opportunity and embrace it, not necessarily going, this remote work thing is going to be a wave of the future. Like everybody's going to be working remote, especially what happens at a pandemic. What happens? Oh yeah. What if a pandemic happens? Then everybody's going to be working forced to work remote then, you know, so it wasn't that it was, Hey, there's an opportunity here to build culture. There's an opportunity here to be more profitable and save my company. You are strategically minded about a vision you had for the future. Um, and remote work just happened to be part of that, right? which made you inevitably an, an expert in that, which then you got paid to speak and write and do all these other things, which now here we are, right? Now you're famous right. on my show. And so it's, uh, <laughs> you know, everything's going to blow up. So super cool. So let's, let's talk about the book, Remote Work. Um, what's the contents? of the book. Why, why should I read your book rather than any of the other remote work books that are out there right now? And everybody's, everybody's been talking about remote work for you know a good yeah. year now, hardcore, but why you now? And there are some good remote work books out there. And I think uh, I would say that you probably should read more than one book. I'm not going to say you should only read one book. You should probably read several. I mean, I know I read like a hundred books on culture to try to get and really figure it out, right? And what, what resonated with me. But our book, I think, is different in that uh, we have the reflections of the pandemic in there. So we have that reality. A lot of these other books were written, most of them were written pre-pandemic. So they, you know, kind of have, it's more of a very uh, singular view. It's a very, you know, small use case where we were talking about what did I do? 
what did my co-author do? She had 300 recruiters around the world uh, that she was managing starting back in 2001. So we took our stories and weaved it in why we thought remote works for a company, why it works for the employee, why it works for leadership. But then we brought in case studies and knowing that our experiences with our size companies may not be congruent with every reader, we uh, interviewed the CEO, now the founder, uh, chairman of the board of Cornerstone On Demand, the largest training company in the world. So he came in and we interviewed him, did a case study on what they did with remote work. So they bought their largest competitor and announced that the day California said everyone has to go shelter in place. And they had to onboard 4,000 people remotely and convert to a completely remote company with you know, 10, 15,000 employees, whatever they got, they had a lot of people. And so we talk about, we show that in the, in the book and how, what they learn and what they discover, right? So there's a big co learnings. And then we looked at, well, who's been doing remote work the longest? And this answer may surprise you, but it's, it is the, uh, the, it is the, the army and the Marines and the, you know, the, our armed forces have actually been doing remote work the longest because you train someone and then you send them off to go somewhere to go work away from headquarters, right? The Pentagon, if the Pentagon is headquarters, you're sending these people all around the world to go work and do jobs. Then some, they're doing them together sometimes, but they're not connected to headquarters, right? They're in headquarters doing that job. And so we interviewed the, uh, a top general from the Marine Corps and talked about how they train people remotely, how they, so it's really a training uh, case study because they have to prepare people who are maybe all dispersed, all totally all over the world and get them ready up to a certain level. And then they all come together in one place to go do a job. Um, or they may not even come together. They may be sent all around the world to do this particular thing to get all these different bases and people. So we brought all these just totally different case studies. We have Girls Inc. in there. So we have like a nonprofit, uh, AMM Healthcare, which is in San Diego near you. They were the ones that had this, they took on the contract for the state of New York. They staffed 5,000 nurses remotely to help. And, and so how did they go from being a totally brick and mortar company, sent everybody home and then have to recruit all these people remotely and get them in to help, you know, remember when New York was literally the worst place you could be in America for COVID, um, they were helping with that. So the book really is a combination of these stories um, of what people did. And then we sort of juxtapose that to super practical things. I mean, we tell you exactly how to do your meetings and exactly how all this stuff needs to work. So one of the worst things I, I, that happened when you read a book or you watch a speaker is they get you really excited and they totally convince you you should do this thing and then they don't tell you how to do it, right? And so we did not want that in this book. We want you uh, to be able to have complete uh, understanding and be able to have enough to do everything that you can to go and start that process. And I've got the first copies ever off print here. It's a, it's a decent size book. I mean, my first book was half the size. So we really did put a lot into it to really try to make it special and useful. And at the field, you want to call it a Bible, a field guide. You I mean, it has the practical knowledge that you need to go and make remote work work. That is very cool. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's hefty, but there's the sounds meaty, you know, it sounds yeah. like there's some really good content. So I'm interested, what was your biggest takeaway from say the military case study for you? What, what was the biggest thing you mentioned training, but, um, mm -hmm. what, what was the biggest aha or the biggest impactful thing you got from the military case study? Yeah. I mean, it was that they were able to train these, these people, um, when I mean train, I mean like they had to learn like how missile missile ballistics work on this particular aircraft or whatever. I mean, they have to learn really complicated, big, big things. And they have to do it remotely, you know, all in different locations and different time zones, working asynchronously and and not fall back on that. Well, we have to all be in one place, right? So traditional training would be, we should all fly them to one base to go look at this one airplane so they can look at this one missile and they can see it and they can really understand it. The military said, no, we can't do that. <laughs> That's too expensive. It's too slow. It's too So they figured out how to train people on their own and with collaboration 
without ever having that person have to physically be in some place. That sort of eliminated that mind block that so many people have. I talked to so many leaders that are like, yeah, but we all got to be together. Right? We have to be together to collaborate. We have to be together to, to brainstorm. And that's bullcrap. That is not true at all. What's true is, is they just don't know how to do those things unless they're all together. And I like, I like to call this signposts. So think about if you worked in a traditional office, you walk in the door and there's your boss standing in the conference room, holding a dry erase pen, standing in front of the big whiteboard, waving you in. It's pretty clear what's going to happen. There's a meeting. <laughs> You've just been invited in. And there's probably going to be some sort of brainstorming, right? They got a pen, the whiteboard. We're going to talk about this is going to be, you're not in trouble. You know, you're probably invited in for your opinion. It's very clear what's going to happen. Those are signposts. Just like, just like when we see a stop sign or, or a traffic light, like we know what to do. And in remote work, we have to recreate those signposts. And this is where people stumble. This is where they get messed up is they don't recreate the signposts. So when do we brainstorm? Well, how do you do that? Well, my company, we call a very specific meeting with a very specific name that has very specific parameters around it. So we know when to do that, right? We have regular team meetings. We have certain sort of recreated structures so that people know when it's time to brainstorm, when it's time to check in, when it's time to uh, update people or do, do a stand up, whatever those things are. So we have to figure that out. I mean, if, if you saw, if you knew that Tom and IT had to talk to your boss, Jane, before your project can move forward. Well, as soon as you see Tom walk across the building and walk into her office and they had a meeting, signpost, you know, now it's time for me to go follow up with Jane because I can move my project. That's all gone in remote work. That's gone. So instead, you got to stop having one-on-one -on -one meetings. You got to have more group meetings and get people talking and collaborating and realizing, okay, this thing has happened and you move the information around. And actually, the good news is that process is better. That process is faster. That process creates more transparency and makes happier employees who perform better and you have higher profits and better productivity. It's just different, right? And you have to kind of re retool things. Much like sitting on a horse is a lot different than sitting in a car. I think we would all rather sit in a car if we were gonna go drive or go somewhere that's two hours away, right? So, but it's just different. You have to figure that out. Yeah. Okay. So this is, this is, you know, so this is the kind of meat, right. That, that I want, right. From those, those learning lessons. So let's, let's stay on this topic of meetings. Um, we're all in meetings every day. We've got meetings. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and they can be various types of meetings. And you talked about some of the way we, we need to rethink meetings, right? Mm -hmm. From one standpoint of, of treating them and treating, treating remote work is not a prohibition, right? Something that's thrusted upon us that we have no control over, but uh, maybe reframing that into understanding that it's an inhibition. It's me telling myself, oh, we can't do it that way because they said we can't, or because we can't do it that way because we've always done it one way and now we can't do it. So it's really about how do we switch that mindset to empowerment and understand how to still be productive. So stay on the top of meetings, what are companies getting right and wrong about meetings right now? What's going on with what, that? What they're getting wrong about meetings is a lot of people are just showing up and just meeting, right? They're like, okay, well, every day, like we don't know how this works, so we're all just gonna show up and be on a two hour Zoom every day. Or we're gonna just keep having these blocks of one hour, you know, just uh, filling people's time up with all these meetings Right. And there's no time to go to the bathroom. There's no time to get something to eat. There's no time to get up and stretch. There's no time to like collaborate with anybody. Um, and there's no time to actually do your stinking work. Are you right? talking about just in the realm of remote work or just any work? Right now I'm saying specifically with remote work. Right. So when, when you're all in an office, meetings will work a little differently. And you, I mean, a traditional office, if you got to go pee, you just say, oh, excuse me real quick. I need to pop out. I'll pop right back in. It's no problem. But when we're sitting on a Zoom, nobody wants to leave, right? You feel trapped in front of your computer, right? And there's people like, I mean, just they're miserable. They're miserable. So we have to change that. What we do is we have very specific meeting types. And we use what we call uh, tribal speak 
to reinforce this. Now, tribal speak is not a new concept. Walmart's got these long acronyms. Uh, Disney, you know, has their own language. I call people cast members. And, you know, they, they have this whole thing that reinforces by changing the name of something. You have a new name. Now everyone goes, oh, well, that, that means this, right? I've learned a new name for something. And that comes with all of these norms and rules and definitions. So I'll give you an example of one of our most common meetings. And we've done over 100,000 of these since we started being remote in 2009. It's called a cockroach meeting. So if you have a cockroach in your bathroom, it's a small problem. You may not want to be the one to clean it up, right? And you need help, but it's a small issue. So we allow anyone at the company to call a cockroach meeting at any time. You can invite anybody you want. So a brand new employee day one, you can invite me, the CEO, to your meeting if you truly think I'm the right person to be on that call. There is no hierarchy. There is no, I have to check with this manager, check with that manager to see if I can actually get that person. To, no, you have total autonomy to call that meeting. It can only be about one item, one, one issue, one cockroach, right? And everyone who's showing up is there to help you solve that one cockroach and that's it. And so uh, it is also optional for you to attend. If you get invited to a cockroach meeting, you might look at it and go, I don't know anything about this. I don't have time for this. You can decline it, right? If you say, I'm super busy today, I have way too many meetings, you can decline it, right? So you're, you as the person being invited aren't obligated to say, you know, to, to be there, but you can. You may not know anything about it, but you're like, I'd like to learn what the answer is to this, I'll show up, right? So it gives everyone a lot of freedom. And then it has all meetings, no matter what the name, they all have to start on time. They all must end early. And I can deep dive into why ending early is important. And we only talk about that one item, right? So we don't ask about our kids. We don't talk about how our day is going. It is show up. And if you're like, hey, I've caught, I need a cockroach meeting. My computer will not do this thing. And the client really needs it. Who can help me? Five to seven people show up. Okay, Scott, this is how you do it. You just need to change that. Oh, cool. Or we all show up. We've never seen this before. We need to go get an appointment with IT. Or maybe your computer needs to be fixed. Or whatever the thing is, right? But very quickly, those people showed up. Information was exchanged. We got you your answer. And on average of seven to eight minutes, we just solved a big problem for you and kept you from spending hours trying to figure this out yourself. Or you calling people one at a time and asking them the same question and having the same conversation to try to figure it out, right? And you get bits and pieces. So we, we take the kind of the power of the crowd, right? You have lots of different experiences and brains and people, and we condense it to where they're only having to give you seven to eight minutes of their time sort of a riff on the five minute favor, right? If I could do a five minute favor for you, I'll do that for just about anybody. If you ask me for help, right? And if I'm gonna take five minutes, sure, I'll help you, right? It's not gonna take all day. <laughs> you're not asking me to move, you know, to help you move. You're asking me to do a tiny little favor. Sure, I can do that, right? So, and we have lots of other meetings like that, but that's the kind of structure, that's the kind of, you know, in, in, intentionality you have to put into these for them to work really well for your people. I love that idea. Because I've never heard of it, number one. And it's amazing now that we have been all over a year in this pandemic of working remote. And we were I was working remote before that, even with my my team. It, it is a tendency of certain personality types to want to get on the call and talk for 10 minutes about your weekend and how things are going. And mm -hmm. I believe in that. We call it third gear time, that water cooler talk that that some people right. really need and desire, they, they miss that from working in person. Um, right. They get energy from that interaction with other people, but you are setting up specific parameters. And I think that's the key is being clear about what this is. Hey, there's a time and place for water cooler talk. Cockroach mm -hmm. meetings are not the time and place, right? We're in, right. we're out, we're getting this thing done, right? right? And I think that that's brilliant. And I don't think enough people in the remote workspace set up boundaries right? They don't, yeah. they just kind of, they abuse that hour block. They don't make meetings 50 minutes. They make them an hour, right? Um, well, the reason we do meetings must end early is this thing called Parkinson's law, which is if you set an amount of time to do something, it will take you that amount of time to do it. 
So if you schedule two hours this weekend to clean the garage, guess what? You're going to spend two hours cleaning the garage. And if you were to squish that down, if you were to say, I only, I'm going to do it in 30 minutes, how might that change your approach? I'm only going to clean the garage for 30 minutes. Well, you might prioritize better. You might move faster. You might ask your family for help. You might hire someone to help you, right? How can I condense that down? But if you set an hour meeting, people just fill it full of crap and they make it an hour meeting, even if it doesn't need to be an hour because there is a subconscious sort of a cognitive bias happening that we scheduled a call from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. So we're going to be here for an hour. And then they just fill it. Now, there are places in our organization and our meetings for us to have time to check in. We like to put all the water cooler stuff in Slack in a water cooler room so that anyone can see it no matter who's on at that time, right? So people who are working at different times and asynchronously, they can get caught up when it's good for them, right? And they can participate. And so we get a much more larger communal uh, experience. But we put our connection time in, into a much more intentional exercise called bonding. And that happens in any meeting that's 30 minutes or more. So we know, okay, bigger meeting, because we have two different 15 minute meetings that we do. And we have some other meetings that are 30 minutes and one hour or even two hours or all day, right? We have these different, different types. But in those meetings that are longer, we intentionally show up and ask everyone how they're showing up. That's the first thing we do. It's not, hey, how's it going? What'd you do this weekend? You have vacation coming? That's kind that's fine, but like, that's not really checking in. Right. If I show up and say, how are you showing up today? And you say, well, my grandmother passed away last night. Oh, you're not really going to be in for this meeting. Like <laughs> you got a lot going on. If you're visibly upset and this was like sudden and you didn't expect, you know, maybe you don't need to be on this call today. Do you need to go take some time? Right. Like you, you as a leader can like figure out, are people really okay? Not the mindless you know, hey, how's it going? Good. Does anyone really mean good when they say that? No, but you have to be really intentional. And then we ask them how they're leaving at the end of the meeting to make sure we're all on the same page, right? And that we, if I thought we had a good meeting, did everyone else think we had a good meeting, right? And are, are, where are we at? And that we find that's much more impactful than just filling it full of junk, you know, on an hour long BS session. So good how are you leaving? Nobody ever asked that question, right? Nobody asked it. They may say, we good? Everybody got that's it? Not the, yeah, you know? not, but that's, 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 you don't really want an answer when you say, are we good? That's just, can I end the call? <laughs> yeah, that's like at, you know, like at 10, 59 and 30 seconds of our 11 o'clock ending meeting, it's like, okay, good, go team. Like, I don't even know if they really listened right. for the answer. They just kind of like, you know, and then they're out. There was a funny meme that says, when somebody asks, does anyone have any questions at the end of a meeting? The answer is always no. Like, don't make the meeting go longer, right? But there should be an intentional five minutes there. Or even, actually, it depends. If, you have, if you have five people on the call, you really only need like two minutes. But it's just, how is everyone leaving? And, and you get an employee-focused answer. The first question, you get a, a person like them as the human being. And the second question is more the employee. It's like, and I'll hear things like, uh, I know we agreed on this, but I don't think our clients are going to like this. And you're like, whoa, where was that? That, oh, okay, well, let's do another meeting. We'll, or, you know, why don't you go back and think about that and come back to us or whatever. Or um, I've even gotten, I don't even know why we had this meeting. Like, we could, could we have just done this on email? Could we order Slack? And it's like, you know what, that's, you're right, we could have because we don't want to have more meetings than we have to, right? So you get really good feedback about the process and about where everybody's at. And if you hear people are confused and you're the leader, well, then go get them unconfused. Work with them, get them the help they need. Don't just let them struggle and be confused and then come to the next meeting and then they're not helpful and you wonder, well, why aren't they being helpful? Because they don't understand yet, right? So we have to have really intention. Again, those are signposts, signposts. Is that person okay to meet right now? Are they in the right mindset to have a meeting? Because if they show up and sabotage a meeting, it's probably because they have something going on in their lives, right? And then are they, are they good to leave the meeting? 
or, or not. So again, it, it just, it's different, right? In a traditional office, we can see the body language and we can see someone acting different. And so we can realize maybe there's something going on with them. If we leave a meeting and they pick up all their stuff and they're real huffy and they like, we know they didn't like the outcome, right? We can pick that up. But for some reason we're on a Zoom call and it's like the meeting's over we click and it's over and we don't see how the rest of it. And so we lose out on some of that information. We just have to you know, change how our approach is and we get actually a much better version than the all, all in the office version. We get a much more intentional version. That's really, really good. There's a, uh, you know, the difference between the, are we clear is kind of like a, I'm supposed to say yes. Um, I might say no, but that's still more of a, a more logical type reaction as opposed to how are we leaving, which is more an emotive type reaction, right? I'm getting more of the feeling, the gut, the, that, uh, the kind of the, the limbic system of my brain, right. Going into the, the why purpose of what am I doing here? Um, and how is this fulfilling us that is a greater whole. Now, um, you have, you have something really cool that you wrote um, about company culture and you define company culture and I haven't heard it this way. I asked a lot of people this question, right? And so you put it this way, a combination of the easily seen ideals, first of all, um, which are vision statements and values. So a combination of the vision statement and values combined with the harder to see norms, which are the behaviors, language, beliefs, and systems. Um, so I love that, that combination of easily seen ideals. Like we see them all the time. Like we, they're on a poster in our break room, you know, mm -hmm. whatever combined with the harder to see norms, which are the everyday behaviors, the language of beliefs and systems. So talk about that combination here. Yeah. I mean, so really culture has to be fed and, and designed and created from the top. Um, that really is one of the few areas where it is top down, right? So the leadership creates that. Uh, and even if, and you can look at that at a really big scale, right? What Steve, you could say Steve Jobs created the culture at Apple, okay? But then most people though, your experience around culture is actually what happens on your team with your boss. Like that's really, so it's really cool um, uh, research out. I think Marcus Buckingham did a lot of it and they showed there was a direct correlation when they looked at uh, how employees uh, responded to what do you think of your company's culture and what do you think of your team's culture, right? Or how do you rank your team? They're almost exactly parallel to each other. So if you like your team, you like your company. If you hate your team, you hate your company, right? So there's this weird combination. So you show up to the company because you believe in their whatever they're selling or doing or whatever, right? In most cases, you're going to have a career somewhere you're somewhat connected to what they're doing and why they're doing it but then it's well what are our meetings actually like and how do you get things done and are if you need to run out the door and go pick up your kid for an hour and come back is everyone cool with that or do you get like stares and people talk about you and you're afraid your boss is gonna write you up or something right there's really subtle little norms and like things that happen inside uh, at a very micro level. And so that's culture, right? That's sort of this combination of things. I can get up as a CEO and say, we're going to be a more diverse company. We're going to hire a more diverse. And then if all the managers only hire exactly what we have in the company right now, right? They, they, that was the norm. They just kept going, right? doesn't matter what I said. So these things have to really work together and challenge and push and pull on each other all the time. And hopefully the leadership is really strong and really committed to what's important on the macro level and that managers are doing a really good job on the micro level to reinforce that and to bring in good behaviors and signposts and norms and meetings and whatever that is to make it a great place to work for, for every employee. All right, so how can people get a hold of you or buy your book? So you can go to chrisdyer.com if you do this before May 25th slash remote work promo and you can pre-order the book in bulk and get thousands and thousands of dollars of free stuff from 50 different companies that support remote work or great work. If this is after, no problem. You can buy it on Amazon or wherever you buy your books online. We're 
can find it everywhere. So um, The Power of Company Culture was my first book, and then Remote Work with uh, my co-author, Kim Shepard. You can find that, uh, again, on Amazon or wherever you buy it. it. It's a nice, nice teal color, so you shouldn't be able to, shouldn't miss it. Should pop <laughs> off the shelves. Well done on the design. That's good. Uh, <laughs> smart, smart. Um, okay, well, thank you very much for the insights and for sharing all this uh, wisdom with us. I know I got some nuggets out of this that I'll share with the audience and in, uh, in the outro here, but uh, I, I really want to appreciate uh, you for your time and uh, investing in us. And hopefully we can pour back into you uh, and go buy your book. Awesome. Thanks for having me on the show. Meetings, meetings, more meetings. They're not going away. We're going to have meetings. We need to stop having meetings just for the sake of having meetings though. And we need to stop feeling like we need to fill up these meetings with things that aren't necessary. So let's be intentional about those meeting structures, right? Create more opportunities for various types of meetings, right? We learned from Chris, they have a bunch of different types of meetings. Set up boundaries to protect the health and culture of your organization because the way your team culture is perceived is the way your company will be perceived. If you as a leader are not intentional about how you treat your employees and about how you lead those meetings, it's going to reflect poorly on the entire organization. And that person is probably going to not want to be there anymore. Then they're going to say things about you when you're not around and you don't like that. So all that stuff happens. This is so important. I learned a ton from this. I've been having meetings all my life, right? You've been too, having meetings all your life too. And it's interesting how we can still learn something important and impactful about how we can lead ourselves in this new era of remote work. Um, I'm super grateful for Chris. Get out, get that book. It's a, it's a meaty book of content, case studies, and some practical tools and lessons you can learn right about how to be more effective and intentional with leading your remote teams super grateful for you for being here today i will um put this on my website and youtube and hopefully well that's where you're watching it and like subscribe comment all those things go link in with me i'd love to connect with you there we can start having some conversations and uh get on with it right but be intentional about those meetings people thank you uh for being here and I will see you next time on another episode of Unlocked.